Thank you for joining us today. I wanna to introduce these amazing panelists and then we will get right into the discussion. So today we are joined by Tatiana Bol Bolton. She is the policy director for R Street Institute's Cybersecurity and Emerging Threats Team, where she leads the public policy strategy with a focus on secure competitive markets, data security and data privacy, as well as diversity in cybersecurity. Tatiana is also a senior director on the U.S. Cyber Sol Solarium Commission, where she previously served as the senior policy director, focusing on U.S. government organization and resilience portfolios. Robert Mayer is senior vice president of cybersecurity with U.S. Telecom Association, where he has a responsibility for leading cyber and national security policy, along with state relations and coordinating a multitude of regulatory initiatives for the wireline broadband industry. He's also the current chairman of the Communication sector of the Co Communication Sector Coordinating Council, which represents broadcast, cable, satellite, wireless, and wireline industries with uh, DHS's public-private partnership. Robert also co-chairs the recently announced Council to Secure Digital Economy, which consists of 13 global ICT infrastructure providers who have joined forces to drive solutions to enhance cyber resilience in the digital ecosystem. Kimball Walden is an attorney at the Digital Security Unit at Microsoft where she operates in the intersection of cybersecurity and critical infrastructure protection. Prior to Microsoft, Kimba spent a decade in the government service as Department of Homeland Security in their attorney, several attorney roles. Most recently, she was an attorney advisor for the newly created Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, and you're gonna hear that acronym a lot today. And then our last panelist is Morgan Wright. He is the Chief Security Officer at Sentinel One and an internationally recognized expert on cybersecurity strategy cyberterrorism, identity theft, and privacy. Previously, Morgan was a senior advisor at the State Department's Anti-Terrorism Assistance Program and a senior law enforcement advisor uh, for the 2012 Republican National Convention. In addition to 18 years in state and local law enforcement, Morgan has developed solutions in defense, justice, intelligence, and the, uh, for some of the largest technology companies in the world. So welcome everybody, and I think you'll really enjoy this, uh, this discussion. So Morgan, I'm going to start with you. Yes. The recent solar wind, uh, the recent solar wind security breach is just the latest example of uh, the incredible landscape that we live in. So, can you walk us through the anatomy of this recent attack and the known victims, as well as the collateral damage that we currently know about, and then that that we're probably expecting to uncover? Yes. So. You know, what I'll do is I'm, I'm going to keep it up, uh, Shane, at the kind of the 50,000 foot view. There's a, probably a lot of technical people and non-technical people on. If you want to do a deep dive, I'm on the Slack channel. Drop me a note. I can get you some information from Sentinel One where we did a deep dive, but this is not a commercial. But let's go back and really talk about um, the way this really happened. This was less of a technology operation as much as it was an intelligence operation that understood how to exploit human weakness uh, conventional uh, wisdom, proverbial thinking, in order to achieve an intelligence uh, objective, which was to get this information. It wasn't, it wasn't about stealing money. It wasn't about bringing down the internet. What they did was they did the same thing you do what in military people understand this term. It's called intelligence preparation of the battlefield. They were able to scan the landscape. They looked for where we were vulnerable. They looked at how we thought about security. And so I'm not going to pick on a company. The actual vulnerability is called Sunburst and the way it was done. But really, let's just the way it was really done, Shane, and, you know, for you folks listening out there, it was done because what they did is they as we were so focused on the 2018 election and stopping the influence operations and the active measures that were being done by the Internet Research Agency, at the same time, a lot of attribution now to one of the Russian intelligence agencies, the SVR, was in the process of designing this entire operation. Probably took them at least a year to put this together. Then they started by deploying some test code into a targeted company. That targeted company was SolarWinds. Why? Because they provided the network management and database management for a bunch of companies around the world, about 300,000, 18,000 appear to have been targeted. But out of that 18,000, who do we target? People like the National Nuclear Security Agency, the Federal, uh, elect, uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, state, DOD, a lot of government clients, a lot of private sector people, defense contractors, big names that you've heard about. Why? They're interested in information. So they were able to insert this code in by probably using social engineering techniques, using spear phishing and phishing emails to get targeted employees inside of SolarWind, as well as maybe other countries where development was being done, compromise them, understand how this thing was built. And then they started the, the operation chain. And what it was, was they put code into the update server. 
and they're able to send out these updates that you all thought were trusted because they were cryptographically signed, you know, big, long, complex number that says, hey, nothing has changed on this. So you installed the update. The other thing it did is it exploited human weakness in terms of how we thought. We thought we'll put it into this little thing called a sandbox. And as long as nothing bad happens within three to four days, then we'll put it into our operational environment. So what did they do? Okay, we'll wait 12 days. Waited 12 days and like a periscope on a submarine popped up, looked around and said, oh, we're in the operational environment. Looked for a couple of other things to say, are there things here we don't want to have in the environment for us to be able to operate successfully? Once all the parameters were met, the code executed. And then what it did, it started stealing information. It started allowing these updates to go in and be able to impersonate people, be able to take over accounts, be able to take over accounts that even had multi-factor authentication. And what did they do? They read emails, they gleaned information. So Shane, that's kind of the 50,000 foot view. Like I said, you know, I'd be glad to provide more technical details, but really at the end of the day, it was an intelligence operation that understood the weaknesses and how we thought and how we deployed security. It was, uh, from a just from a professional standpoint, it was actually very outstanding trade craft. And this has now forever changed how we view things, how we view the world. I did a keynote a while back, uh, which I said, trust no longer exists as we know it. It used to be verified than trust and trust, but verified. I don't even know if we can do any of those things anymore. Interesting. So the whole concept of zero trust has zero trust. So not good. <laughs> Tatiana, you have spent a lot of time looking at this from all sides of the equation and most recently in your role at the cyber, the cyber space Solarium Commission, as they called it. Can you give us um, some ideas of like kind of a look back? I realize you guys were looking very heavily at this with hopes to get ahead of this issue or a problem like this happening. What could have been in place do you think could have been helpful to this and what are the lessons we've learned that we need to make sure are in place going forward? I think that um, there's a lot of things that we could have done. And certainly in the introduction to the report, you can see us sort of thinking through a major disruption, a major attack, and talking about how our sort of report is attempting to bring us back from that brink and ad address these things. Uh, a lot of the things we talked about, for example, resilience, right? Like building a risk management cycle that works well, uh, establishing a Bureau of Cyber Statistics that can provide information to critical infrastructure owners and operators and can uh, influence policymakers with, uh, with information that they can use to draft and uh, craft uh, appropriate policy. Um, things like amending the Sarbanes-Oxley Act and developing uh, secure cloud certifications. All of these things uh, are, are what could have uh, prevented something like this from happening. And we hope to uh, move forward and uh, put these into the next year's NDAA or as standalone um, bills so that we can be prepared uh, next time around. One of the things we actually did get done, which is uh, fantastic, is the National Cyber Director, which passed in last year's NDAA and has been, uh, is being stood up right now within the White House. Uh, we hope to hear an announcement on who that will be shortly, but I think that the leadership in the White House, someone focusing on cybersecurity day after day, waking up in the morning and thinking about cybersecurity, that is one of the critical pieces. Uh, that was missing after the, uh, you know, after the removal of the uh, cybersecurity coordinator in the last White House. Um, so I, I'm glad that we saw that change uh, along with the 24 other changes that we got put into the NDAA this year. So uh, hopefully we can we can make some changes in this next year as well. Fantastic, and we will come back to the National Cyber Director because that's going to be a hot topic. Um, Robert, 20 years ago, we thought a lot of this was just the federal government's challenge and industry was in its own swim lane. And now we realize it's everybody's problem. We have to coordinate. And you are spending a lot of time doing the coordination uh, point for your industry. Uh, can you walk us through where you guys are, some recommendations that you've made, things we should be looking at as we move forward um, in this public-private partnership space? Uh, you're on mute, Robert. Robert, you're on mute. I, I, I got it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. I wanted uh, to hear you. <laughs> no, sure. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, you're right. I think 20 years ago, we were swimming in our own lanes, but 20 years ago, we had no idea, I think, or few of us had an idea of how um, significant cybersecurity threats would be for our national economic security, and uh, to some extent, even at the existential level that it's a threat today. Um, 
I think it's, you know, based on what you've heard and based on what everybody understands at this point, uh, this is something that industry and government cannot do alone. We really need to be engaged in ways that are even more substantial than have existed in the last decade under what we call the public-private partnership. I read a blog this morning that talked about uh, the difference between a parent-child relationship uh, and a spousal relationship where there's mutual respect and there's a recognition of, of different interests. I think we're at the point right now where we need to engage uh, as industry with our government partners in ways that we haven't done so before. And I think this is being reflected in the real world. I'll give you two examples. One is um, immediately after uh, solar winds, our regulator, the FCC, reached out to uh, the communication sector coordinating council, the major associations, um, some of the largest company, some of the largest ISPs and said, look, we want you to come in. We want to understand exactly how you've been impacted by this, uh, what efforts you took on, uh, have been, you have taken to protect and, and detect the, um, the activity. Um, respond and recover. Uh, and that has gone forward. And there is this real sharing of, I think, important information uh, in, a, in, a, in a safe and contained environment, because many of these companies, as well as the government, are still investigating. When Morgan described the extent of activity associated with solar winds, it's easy to understand that we haven't captured and fully understood um, all of the implications of the attack and, and what's been impacted. Um, another area that we've worked on in the last couple of years, and we may talk about this some more, is a uh, within DHS, this, the ICT Supply Chain Task Force, um, where we've been working with about 12 government agencies, um, all of the major IT companies, the global comm companies. Uh, we had 300 people working for two years on the task force. We've developed reports uh, on the supply chain. This was a supply chain um, uh, software attack. Um, clearly, it was something that was anticipated on one, on one level, but really not fully understood and appreciated. So we are going back into the reports and the materials that we developed over the last two years and see what we, what we, what we pointed to as potential risk, what we may have missed, and then most importantly, what can be done going forward to uh, address this kind of attack. And I'm interested, and we'll hear more about this, you know, when you're talking about zero day, when you're talking about backdoor attacks, um, is this is something that we can really reasonably expect the private sector, especially if they're competing against, if they're working against a foreign adversary to protect themselves against? And what does that mean for the government uh, private sector relationship? Great. I'm so excited you're able to join us for this conversation because you have been at the, you know, ground zero for a lot of this for the last 10 years on just trying to get the planning right. And I know that there's so many challenges uh, with jurisdiction, you know, you know, how, Congress wanted to manage, how the administration wanted to manage, change the administration while you were there, as well as we want to hear about how you're now, you know, on the other side of the fence with Microsoft. But I was thinking about, um, you mentioned in a previous conversation you we had with the presidential directives, executive orders, the dozens of new laws that are being passed, not only, you know, federally dealing with state and local as well as international. So how do we take into account what's currently in place and recommend uh, the right direction and guidance going into, especially a new administration? Great. Well, first, thank you for having me here. Um, like you said, I, I spent some time at DHS um, and I've been here at Microsoft for a little under two years. Um, and in, my, in both positions, I've observed um, a few things, right? First, I'm a huge advocate of information sharing. I do think just uh, to pick up where Robert uh, left off is that the public sector and the private sector really need to double down on working together, right? We've made some headway over the last two administrations, the Obama administration and the Trump administration um, in, in significant ways, but we really need to get, get at it now. Um, and you would ask specifically, what are some of the tools that, that we have that we may not be optimizing at this moment? Uh, this was a software supply chain uh, security attack compromise here. Um, there are a couple of things. Uh, the, the federal government recently passed, uh, not, maybe not so recently now, it was December 2018, the Federal Acquisition Supply Chain Security Act, which gave the federal government um, more procurement actions to take based on risk assessment of their supply chain, right? Software is, is part of that. Um, we haven't really leveraged that authority. We have the Keep saying we, it's only been two years. Uh, the government has exclusion authority, removal authority. They can really uh, take a deep dive look into their trusted partnerships with vendors. Um, vendors, on the other hand, have 
the opportunity to weigh in on how individual departments and agencies um, assess risk from their point of view in that, in that structure. The regs came out, I think, relatively recently in the last two or three months. So the, so the act was passed in the Obama administration, the regs were, were finalized in the Trump administration. So there is a, a sort of continuity there. Um, I will also say that <clears throat> in the private sector, I've observed that, you know, we've always known this, but the private sector owns, you, you hear statistics anywhere between 70% to 85% to 90% of critical infrastructure. Um, so, and the private sector actually has more access to signals intelligence in a lot of ways than the government does. The government has more authority to do things with that intelligence than the private sector does. So there really needs to be a, 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 a cooperative, collaborative, actionable relationship between the two in order to be able to address something like supply chain, software supply chain security, and to restore trust, right? Um, most of these attacks that you've seen in the, uh, over the last several years, in my estimation, were about eroding trust in one way or another. Um, so I think I think partnerships are where we need to, to work. Um, I will say the other few uh, legal authorities that the federal government is contending with um, to address these sorts of issues. Um, it, let's not forget about the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, something that I worked on actively while I was at DHS, and other. Um, similarly situated organizations like Team Telecom. So Team Telecom, CFIUS, the Federal Acquisition uh, Security Council, the FASC, those are all meant to be um, uh, interagency driven, risk informed uh, processes for bringing trust back into our supply chain uh, security. I hope that answers your question, Jane. No, it does. I mean, there's just, uh, you know, part of, the challenge is CISA tends to be a bit of a hot potato. No one's, you know, everybody knows that they need to be doing something, but not everybody wants responsibility for what needs to get done. Uh, you know, former or, uh, Mike, you know, General Mike Hayden, former director of both the CIA and NSA, used to say the cyber cyber cavalry is not coming, but I think we all want them to, right? You know, and this is, you know, what we're talking about with the wanting offensive measures to be much more proactive. We're, we're still kind of on our back foot on defensive measures. Um, so uh, part of that challenge is we're, you know, we've, with the national cyber director, like, do we need to make major changes? Is that an administration perspective where they are like, okay, we're just, we, we're just going to say this has to be done. And, and it's by edict of the president versus waiting for Congress to get this right. Or is it a combination of the two? And then eventually we have to get into the international discussion because we need our partners to be on the same page with us on a lot of these things. So what do we do about the national cyber director? What, what do we want to see them take on with their space? anyone opening it to the group. Let me throw out one thing. You can have all the positions you want, but they have to come with three things or they'll never be successful. Responsibility, accountability, and authority. You can give people all the mandates in the world you want, but unless there's teeth behind it, unless there's a process that says this shall be the single person. And if you remember after 9-11, what did we create? The director of national intelligence. Why? Because we had a lot of intelligence uh, you know, agencies operating independently. And it used to be the head of the CIA was also the director of central intelligence. They were the person that gave the briefings to the president. CIA kind of led that charge. Now it's the DNI. You can argue whether or not that's successful or not, but at some point you, you can say, what is the equivalent of a DNI in cyber? What is the equivalent of where everything flows up to one place that has responsibility, accountability, and authority to make decisions, to spend budget? Uh, I, if you just leave it in the government hands, we are not going to solve this problem. I mean, government is not cannot solve every problem. They can enable the solution, but they cannot solve every problem. And this is where, uh, as Kemba was saying, this public-private partnership, not only between information sharing, but between quantum computing, you know, uh, things like uh, artificial intelligence, there has to be collaboration for us to develop the next generation of solutions that are going to defend and protect the United States. Tatiana, you, the, the um, National Defense Authorization Act that passed just early this uh, year, this month, had a numerous of your uh, committee's recommendations in it. Uh, so it seems like I understand what Morgan's saying that, you know, the government can't take it all on, but certainly the government can be better structured for this. So what should we expect now that the NDA is passed to, that will be changing? Uh, well, well, so, you know, uh, obviously we just talked about the National Cyber Director. 
sector. And I, you know, I, I agree with Morgan. I think that um, it does need those things. I think that uh, our proposal and uh, our recommendation and the NDAA did a good job of imbuing that office with the appropriate authorities. Um, and, you know, it'll remain to be seen how the president uses this office. And I, it is my sincere hope that the majority of uh, the USG and everyone who sort of works in the cybersecurity sphere uh, does its best to uh, work with the NCD and uh, give it sort of the prominence that it needs to do its job uh, correctly. Uh, one of the other things that, uh, you know, that we did uh, and were successful in, uh, in passing through the NDAA was uh, strengthening CISA. Um, you know, CISA, I think, uh, is, is a place where it hopes to be the cyber expert. It hopes to coordinate U.S. government efforts, uh, handle federal cybersecurity, and the commission felt strongly that CISA was unresourced and undervalued and generally unprepared to handle the job that it wasn't, you know, that it was intended to do. I mean, I, you know, I'm sure all of you read the uh, multiple reports uh, and comments that came out after the SolarWinds attack about, well, should we have CISA? What's the point? What, you know, what did we spend all this money on Einstein for when, you know, clearly it failed or like, what's the point of CDM? Um, you know, I I think that that's the sort of the wrong question. <laughs> the people on the Hill asking the question of why isn't CISA doing what we've given it money to do is really more the question of, well, why, why didn't the Hill fund CISA to a point that was commensurate with the job that was given to it, to your point about uh, mandates, unfunded mandates. Uh, you know, CISA doesn't have nearly enough resources to protect the federal government networks, let alone and all the other uh, efforts that it needs to do. There's a lot of good people doing good work there. And the commission felt um, that that needed to be sort of strengthened. That that did pass through the NDAA. So you're going to see a lot of that happening. I think DHS and CISA right now are doing a lot of um, a lot of looking through the NDAA and figuring out how to uh, you know take in some of these new authorities and responsibilities. Uh, and, and work to kind of improve the uh, risk management aspects and the support to the private industry that it got. Uh, so you're going to see you're going to see a lot of that. Um, I think a lot of planning. There's also uh, there's also some good uh, some good provisions to support uh, the DoD, Cybercom, reviewing the Cyber Mission Force, uh, things that we recommended that are desperately needed in order to uh, bring the you know the offensive cyber also up to speed with where we are in 2020 and cyber attacks. I mean, I think that. Um, what we've seen is that we've been operating under these strategies and force structures that were created 10 or sometimes 15 years ago. And we've been operating with the same manpower, same personnel, and that is insufficient. Uh, we recommended, uh, we wanted to recommend a review of those um uh, of those structures and and that uh, funding. And I think you'll see a lot of uh, improvement uh, over the course of the next three years as these agencies sort of uh, take take that uh, those changes and make them real. I, I'm really hoping, because I know you spent a lot of time on this, you do kind of the Tatiana top 10, do these first. <laughs> and so we're we'll really looking for you to be like the R Street, like, all right, for all those members of Congress, they're like, where do I start? Yeah, you're talking about. I'm sure you got it, and we look forward to reading it. You, you all brought up an, a, the point of the gap in, in intelligence. How do we manage that? How do we get past this fact that we're we have a lot of information, but it's not flowing in a way that's that's getting us ahead of the game here? Shane, I'll, I'll take a shot at that. But before I do that, I just want to very quickly uh, go to the issue of the new appointments in the cyber directorate position. Um, I think we're sending in a very important signal the Biden administration in terms of the caliber of the people who have either been announced or reported to be in, in new positions. Um, I think it's been pretty clear that when the decision was made to not replace the cyber coordinator in the last uh, administration, um, we saw a lot of activity happening at different agencies that arguably were not rationalized and there was duplication of effort, especially in areas like supply chain and, and, and 5G. What is going to be interesting in that area is um, uh, you've got now the National Cyber Director, you've got Ann Neuberger, who's coming in from uh, NSA in a senior position. Um, you've got somebody coming in at CISA. Um, all of these people are going to have um, 
responsibilities for coordinating aspects of cybersecurity, whether it's in coordination in the intelligence community and information sharing, public-private partnership, how they work together, how they coordinate, how they establish priorities, and how they communicate that to industry is going to be very, very important. And we don't have that insight yet. Um, so I, I suspect that the way this administration will work is that they will be highly coordinated. Uh, most importantly, they'll be sending an important signal to industry and the world writ large that cyber matters. They have all the gravitas that you would look for in leadership. Um, so I may have taken up my time on the Intel front, but I will just say on the in information sharing question you asked. Um, well, while, while you have the floor, if you want to go on on the yeah, gap of intelligence, please do. <laughs> and I want to just kind of tout the work that we did at the ICT Supply Chain Task Force. We had two years of work on information sharing. And one of the things that we, we discovered was, um, and you know, when you talk about information sharing is industry to industry, industry to government, government to government, government to industry. Uh, the FASC is part of the task force. Um, so there's been a lot of conversation. What we found was that in terms of sharing information, industry to industry in particular, for example, um, there are a lot of liability concerns because if you suspect a particular vendor, you're sus suspicious, you have to be very careful about how you communicate that to, to the industry or government because there are antitrust issues, there are state causes of action, there's a whole bunch of legal activity. That's going to require us to go back to the Hill and revisit information sharing and see whether or not we can get uh, some liability protections, both for industry and also government. The ability for some of these agencies to share with other agencies is limited. So I think we have to go back and really wrote a root on a whole issue of intelligence sharing and information sharing and see what can we do to identify the areas where they're friction and let's, let's remove them so that we can have, uh, uh, we can stop this kind of siloed view of just one piece of a, of a big elephant. Thank you. Simba, you want to get in there? Yeah, I'd like to offer a couple of observations. Um, and this has been a fun conversation, by the way. So I, I feel like I need to address a couple of things while I have the, the, the floor. Um, in addition to what Robert Mayer just described with uh, the potential new, CISA, the rumors of the new CISA director, the cyber director within CISA, um, the national cyber coordinator, uh, uh, director, um, don't forget Lisa Monaco in, at DOJ and our cyber enforcement authority. Right across the government, you know, including DHS's uh, law enforcement authorities. And, and uh, if Ali Mericus is sworn in, he's got a rich background in that space as well. Um, the, the, I wanna bring up intelligence uh, sharing and information sharing. Um, Robert wrote, brought up a real concern um, among the private sector, which is, is, which is liability. Um, in 2015, I believe, the Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act was passed. Uh, in an effort to resolve um, the antitrust issues, the, the liability issues that were faced by the private sector, the CISA 2015. It's unfortunately the same name as the, the new acronym given to our new agency, CISA. Um, it's the Information Sharing Act. Um, uh, provides FOIA protections, protections against disclosure on, under FOIA, protections and disclosure under the Sunshine Acts, um, liability protection for uh, industry, the industry sharing industry, the DHS sharing agency, the agency sharing, um, and a whole, whole host of other protection, antitrust protections and DOJ provided a, a complementary um, legal opinion about that as well. Uh, so I think as the private sector begins to use some of that um, in CISA 2015, uh, we'll see clearly that Congress will need to update it some to address some of our, our newer risks, um, but that we should probably encourage industry to, to share more and to explore some of those liability protections afforded to them that aren't really optimized. Um, on intelligence sharing gaps, I'm sorry, one last. Um, okay. we have, there's, a, there's a clear gap and maybe it's rightful um, that uh, you know, 12 triple three authorities for the intelligence community um, does not allow for collecting domestically, right? Um, that's a good thing. Um, but for information that is collected domestically, how do you make sure that um, the intelligence community needs what it needs lawfully um, to be able to connect those dots, the hops that might occur overseas into the hops that occur into the core of our critical infrastructure? How do we connect those dots? Um, how do you make sure that the private sector has the right level of clearance um, and it, it to be with timely and actionable information to be able to take action to complement 
uh, the work by Cybercom or NSA, the, the, the offensive work, the defensive work of CISA. Um, I think- so I both, Go ahead, I'm sorry, Shane. I was gonna say, both of you bring up, the, it's, it's a, a bit of an infinity loop we have here, which is without the liability reforms, which give people the feeling that they can appropriately share information, which we need as real time as possible, um, we, we, we don't, we need that clarification so we can get to the gap, you know, we're talking about the gap of intelligence. That's, it's a lot of the reason we're the gap in intelligence and Tatiana, you had your hand up. You're on mute. You. Sorry, okay. on that specific point, um, you know, one of the recommendations that we put forward was specifically to address the, some of these concerns, which was this um, codifying systemically important critical infrastructure. Now, this doesn't get to the problem of sharing sort of across the board for all uh, companies, but it does address sort of some of the most critical issues, which are uh, the, you know, the financial exchanges and the critical energy um, companies or nodes of, of uh, 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 production and transmission of energy, uh, uh, among others, including communications. Um, the idea being that uh, if you, we can identify something like a Section 9 list, but codified in law, uh, with imbued with some benefits and some um, and some requirements, uh, you ideally would set a certain standard of requirement, and the companies on that list would be would be held to the, to a specific standard to protect what we believe is critical, the most critical of critical infrastructure. And if you are uh, on this list, then you also get perhaps some liability protections that if you're hit by an APT and if you're hit by China or Russia, if you're targeted, then it's unreasonable to assume you'd be able to protect yourself. And if you show that you have done sort of the due diligence to protect your company and networks from an attack, uh, then you would be uh, then you would be protected from liability, and you would be given, for example, better coordination with the federal government. You'd be prioritized in terms of uh, perhaps intelligence collection or information that the government could share with you. And so the idea is that you would get information, but then with that um, sort of better collaboration and coordination and some uh, other benefits, you would also be held to a higher standard. And so, so we believe that was a really critical piece to uh, ensure at least the most critical of our um, industries was protected. And I think that along with some of the other, uh, some increasing intelligence support to the private sector and codifying processes for identifying private sector cyber uh, intelligence needs, that uh, all together could create a, an, uh, a, a framework that would improve intelligence and the collection and cybersecurity for uh, our critical infrastructure. Morgan, does this all sound actionable to you? Oh, this is this is one of the meaty issues I want to get into. Look, I, I spent a lot of time down at Department of Justice building what's called One DOJ, the plan to share information between 18,000 federal, tribal, state, and local law enforcement agencies. On top of that, the big question, I think uh, Kemba got into it too, is how do you share intelligence with certain places. And the problem is you can't because you cannot clear enough people that can take action within every agency to be able to act upon that information. So we started creating what we call the shareable tear line initiative. How do you write an unclassified version of the cable? I don't care what cave in Afghanistan, there's a plot being hatched. I care about what's the piece of infrastructure I need to worry about defending. And the quick history lesson I'll give people is, uh, and uh, don't raise your hands because I told you guys this yesterday. How many people know who Oleg Penkovsky was? Codename Hero. How did we know how to avert the Cuban Missile Crisis back in the 60s? It wasn't because of technology. It was because we had a spy inside the Russian military that told us, the CIA, what was coming in, and then we flew our technology over to confirm that. We, the One of the reasons we have an intelligence gap today is because we've lost human intelligence. We're great at SIGINT, ELINT, name all the other INTs, but when it comes to human intelligence, we don't have, the, we have lost 80%, maybe 90% of the agents we had in China. They've all been caught and killed. We've lost a lot of agents in Russia. So it's, you cannot look at technology as a simple silo and say, well, we, we can solve it if we just look at technology. It's the blend of human intelligence, technical intelligence, you know, signals intelligence. It's everything coming together. Last point too, um, I would say I sat in a briefing a few years ago with uh, John Carlin. You might remember him, Kemma, the Assistant Attorney General for National Security. 
every Fortune 500 company has been breached, every single one of them. If you think you can defend against a nation state, you can't. Enough time, they have the time, the resources, the tradecraft to get into everybody. So this gets back into we, one of the intelligence gaps we have is our failure, and I saw it in a comment, that the 9-11 commission, their final finding was failure of imagination. We could not see an attack like solar winds come and we thought that our sensors overseas, NSA, US Cyber Command, we could detect this stuff. That gets into 1, uh, 12 triple three that Kemba was talking about. What authorities do we have to collect intelligence? We have a de bright, de bright line between domestic and international for a reason because we do not operate as uh, dictatorships too, as other countries too. So we, guess what? I don't think we'll ever solve that problem. I think we will always have an intelligence gap. Why? Because I don't want the NSA and the CIA spying on American citizens in order to do, or that's just a decision you have to make in a free country. Sorry, I got a little emotional there, but having friends who have served, lost people in the line of duty, lost them in military action. And I know the consequences of lack of intelligence. This is probably a problem we cannot solve, but we can do a better job at sharing information in order to make better decisions. Can I ask Morgan a question, Shane? Do you mind? I want to follow up. Yeah, so as, I, as I understand it, um, one of the reasons on Solar Winds was that they actually came and penetrated U.S. servers to avoid having certain agencies mm -hmm. having the ability to make that detection. Is that right? Absolutely. They got in. They got in through Solar Winds. They also utilized servers in the United States. They used anti-forensic techniques and obfuscation and things called steganography to hide their traffic. Why? Because they knew that Cyber Command and NSA had sensors out there that could see things externally. We just because of everything from posse comitatus to uh, other authorities, you cannot operate. In fact, if you guys remember during the DC sniper case, there was a lot of issues about even the military flying air support over the DC region to provide uh, advanced technology in order to locate the sniper. So yeah, to your point, Robert, we, we were blind. Uh, we could see everything externally. We just couldn't see what was happening internally. So that's a very good point. If we can walk that back for a second, because I'm not sure everybody understands what you all just said. And Kimba, I think you're probably in the best situation to kind of dial this back again for us. So we didn't, what, what did, how did they get onto the U.S. soil without being detected since we're saying they're Russians? I'm not going to, I'm not going to answer that specific question. I'm going to leave that for Morgan, sort of the how technically they did it. But um, theoretically, what Morgan is saying, just in the real simplified Kemba non-technocrat terms, um, they, they went straight into the domestic um, our domestic infrastructure, right? They they went circumvented the the border and just went straight in, right? So that they wouldn't trap trip the the protections that we have in place that we are authorized. We meaning the U.S. government are are authorized to see outside of our borders, right? This is one of the reasons why um, Tat what Tatiana described early is, 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 is really important. Um, CISA is really now going to be, or our domestic, our domestic agencies are really now going to be, or are at the front lines of nation state cyber attacks. I mean, they are at the front line. It's, it's not necessarily though we need, but not necessarily cyber command and, and DOD and our, and our strength there. It's really what's at the heart of the country. Um, I don't know if Morgan wants to describe the how they came in to our systems and how they evaded um, the, our authorities externally, uh, but they really just come straight into the, and I think this is not the last time, unfortunately, we're gonna see this sort of approach because it, it, it seems to have worked. Well, I, and before Morgan, I would like you to explain that, but I, I remember back in mid, like 2014, 15, this became an issue with the financial services industry because they, uh, it was a Middle Eastern attack that realized that they could drive in, right in between that space, right? That they could go into the, the JP Morgan and Stanley and all these, these banks and get information and that the U.S. couldn't come in and, and cover, you know, the, this situation. So they figured out that, that fine line. And I don't, I think, and Tatiana, I think you're probably about ready to jump to say something. I'd love to hear it. It's like, have we, have, are we on the path of fixing that problem, which is really a procedural problem or process? Anyone? Because I, I, it just seems like it's, it, I get why it exists and it's very analog, but in a digital world, we need to move beyond that as being, you know, how we decide what we, we manage from information and defense and offense. Can I throw something out there while, while Tatiana is collecting our thoughts yeah. that we haven't really touched on yet on this panel? We really do need to, and the Cyber Serum Commission addressed this, we really do need to 
um, start thinking more clearly about uh, in international norms, cyber norms, um, and working more, more closely and more methodically in a coordinated way with our international uh, partners. And I think that's one of the structural. Um, I will also add, yeah, um, and you know, Kemba and I saw this from CISA and we worked together on um, some of the, these things. And I think we kind of both saw that um, some of these things that people are talking about, in fact, some of the questions that are popping up in the in the chat uh, mention a lack of creativity or a lack of imagination. And, you know, I think this actually boils down to um, the who is doing some of this stuff and the leadership that's necessary. So for me, two of the biggest things that, and we sort of touched on it in a, the commission report, we did do a follow on um, a white paper on this topic as well, is leadership and workforce. I know people consider workforce sort of a, you know, a black sheep kind of, uh, you know, I don't know, Don Quixote style, like, you know, tilting at windmills thing, because there, there's a lot of a lot of efforts on it and very little gets done. But I honestly believe that if we want more creativity, if we want to think more like the adversary, if we want to move away from the way in which we've been doing cybersecurity, we need to include more people and a diverse view, different diverse views from different people who can think differently, right? If we keep using, if we keep doing what we've been doing, we will keep getting what we have been getting. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a trope because it's so true. The, we have a lack of diversity in the field. We have very few people who come in it that aren't sort of like computer science, like cybersecurity background. We have only 20, something like 30% women in the field, very few uh, minorities. We just don't think uh, kind of broadly. We, we are not, you know, we, we need to get a broader pipeline of people coming from a various different um uh, skill sets, various different, uh, you know, degrees that are, that need to be in cybersecurity. It's not just the computer scientists that we need. We need to be taking in uh, people with communications degrees and poli-sci degrees and international relations and everybody, um, everybody from those fields. We also, I think, and uh, at, at our street, we're working on this, trying to educate uh, groups that work with cybersecurity, but don't really understand cybersecurity, such as like, uh, like generally attorneys, although obviously Kemba, you are very well acquainted with cybersecurity. Well, but I would argue that. that there needs to be more of that. <laughs> I think uh, there needs to be more of that, uh, more for attorneys, more for judges, more for business executives, so that we can, you know, change the culture around cybersecurity. And that is where I think you're going to get big returns on your investment. Morgan, want to? Oh, sorry, Robert, go ahead. Yeah, I keep on going back. I agree go with everything that Tatiana said about workforce and all, all of that. A couple of things. One is, um, we're still in the blaming the victim mode. I don't care what anybody says. There's still going to be an impulse on the part of government, I think, to say, what can industry do more? How can you protect yourself? Uh, what are you not doing? How much more can you be spending? Um, I think that's a misplaced thought right now, because um, as people have said, you know, when you when in a kinetic environment, if a foreign government attacks you and they start hitting your physical facilities and taking you out, nobody expects a company to come in and, you know, respond with jet fighters and whatever uh, other other activity. So we have to one, understand that uh, in a nation state and global criminal enterprise system, we're facing something completely different. The second thing we need to do is we're not imposing a cost on the adversaries. Uh, one of the first things that President Biden indicated very early on was when he was responding to solar wind, he said, we, got, we have to make it more costly for our adversaries. We've been saying this for years. Now, I don't know what is happening behind the scenes in cyber command, I just know the result. And from looking at the result, it doesn't appear to me that some of these major companies and the Commerce Department just identified six foreign adversaries, you know, China, North Korea, Iran, uh, Cuba, uh, they're not stopping. They're continuing to attack on a daily basis, very significant attacks. Um, so somehow the message hasn't gotten to them that there's a cost. And so we have to start figuring out um, how do we make it co more costly for them? Because they have all the economic advantages 
it's, it's an asymmetric battle for, between defender and the originator of the attack. Uh, if we can't level the playing field, we're going to get further and further behind. We're not going to make, and then there's going to be, you know, an unrealistic expectation that somehow the private sector is going to fix it and make it, make us more secure, or we're going to regulate the private sector and that'll work. Well, the federal agencies were essentially regulated. They all had FISMA. They all had requirements, compliance requirements. They didn't even identify solar winds. It was the private sector that identified. So the entire model has to be re-examined from square one. And I hope as we go forward, we're not having the same conversation we had, you know, uh, with the old legislation of Coleman's, Lieben, Lieberman and Rockefeller Snow, we really need to rethink what the responsibilities are and how we work together and collaborate. And we got to do it quickly. Sorry. So you've all brought up elements of our international challenges here. Kim, you mentioned cyber norms, uh, which is obviously our key. And back in the Obama administration, I think, you know, I was very excited with the work that Chris Painter was doing. And it was interesting, though, we saw him move from the White House to the State Department, which is good from a diplomacy perspective, but I think it was also maybe sidelining cyber as people didn't understand that it was so integrated into how the economy works now. Now I don't think anybody questions the digital economy, especially during COVID and it's all doing Zoom calls like this, but where where do we start? I mean, where, where, where do we pick the ball back up if we feel like it got dropped on the idea that we need it, international points of view on this? It, may it be um, if there's repercussions or are the dialogues, you know, Robert just mentioned the, the, the classic six uh, who are always causing trouble. You know, how do, how do we make them understand that we're serious about stop messing with our systems? Isn't that to anyone. Go ahead, Morgan. You got to go off mute. Yeah, I'm going to be the pessimist. We're not. You know, this. I know Robert was talking about we we'll want to level the playing field. My belief is we'll never level the playing field because the advantage is always with the adversary because they pick the time and place that they want to do the attack. They pick the time and techniques, tactics, tradecraft that they want to employ. What we have to get better at, you military folks out there, left a boom, right? Uh, OODA loop. How fast can we get our decision-making processes so that we may not we don't have the advantage of the initiative that the adversary does, but we need to have the advantage of response that puts speed and precision into our ability to respond to these things. That's how you deflect, that's how you mitigate the cost of an attack. Um, I'd love to raise the cost of an attack on a lot of these attackers. I think you can do it with criminal organizations, uh, but nation state actors. Um, you want to talk about norms? How do you plan on negotiating with China for norms in cyberspace where we're currently battling with them in outer space? You know, we're looking at what are the rules out there. Russia, we have a lot of the major players that will not negotiate with the United States. We have our Five Eyes Alliance, U.S., Canada, um, Australia, New Zealand, and Great Britain. Great, we've got five folks, but uh, the U.N., is that the proper place? Is it NATO? So, I mean, we have a lot of things. I don't ever think we'll get back to this. You know, what we're going to get is this squishy middle that says one day the pendulum's way over here. One day the pendulum's way over here. And I think our ability to survive this is finding out how do we live in the squishy middle that allows us the flexibility to make decisions each day. But um, I just go back to, um, well, we just, we have lost the integration or we haven't really explored the integration of human intelligence with all of our others, including cyber intelligence to get better. I would have, you know what I would have preferred to stop this attack? is having a spy inside the SVR calling up one of our uh, agents uh, or uh, case officers and saying, hey, guess what? We have an operation going on. Here's what it is. Here's what you can do to stop it. A at the end of the day, I think quite personally, as somebody who's trained people in that and uh, taught behavior analysis out at the NSA, taught to the agency, um, it's to me, it's a people game. And we're losing the people game because we believe too much in the technology and not enough in the people. And that gets into the international. I don't think we'll ever solve the international, but how do we survive in that squishy middle? Not loving the idea of a squishy middle, I'll be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody want to take the, the counterpoint or elaborate on other processes that might be more uh, optimistic? Please. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think that there is more uh, that we can do. For example, I mean, we don't even have an assistant secretary of state for cybersecurity. Cybersecurity in the State Department is like a 10 person shop, right? Like, how do we intend to uh, even communicate our uh, signals to uh, adversaries or friends if we don't even have the diplomats that are out there doing that? So, uh, you know, an assistant secretary of state for cyber. Uh, 
Cyber Diplomacy Act sort of puts that into play uh, this year, and I hope that that passes. Um, also, you know, doing more MLATs and more ALATs for the FBI um, so that they can uh, so they can track sort of criminal activity and, and find faster and make sure that we're communicating with our international counterparts. Um, and we can improve cyber capacity building as well. And if we work with our international partners, improve capacity, I think that there is something to be uh, to be said for that. Um, in terms of in terms of uh, imposing costs, I think that. Uh, our attribution process is incredibly slow, um, and we don't have a sort of a strong um, a path for that right now. We have sort of a uh, an ad hoc an ad hoc system that um, you know that we can certainly improve. Um, but you know, you can sort of you can raise costs on adversaries in two ways, right? Like you can you can impose costs on them after they've attacked, but you can also make it more costly to attack you. So that's the resilience piece that I think is so critical that we're missing. We haven't even raised the our, our walls, right? Like we haven't even um, secured our networks to a point where it's hard and expensive to attack them, right? Um, and that's not just for private industry, it's for the government, it's for everyone. And like, you know, sure, FISMA, but like, uh, I think that we still have a whole lot more to to go in terms of both federal government cybersecurity and private uh, industry cybersecurity. So, you know, I think that there's a lot more work that we can do to just increase costs on the adversary in that way. Um, you know, and that that's part of the Solarium sort of mindset is that we have sort of a defense in depth, right? We're not just trying to, you know, tell adversaries after they've hit us that like, we're going to deter you by some, by putting you on like an entities list or hitting you with sanctions after you've done that. The idea is you, you create this defense uh, through separate layers, right? And the first layer is resilience. So that's sort of my thought. Kim, any additional thoughts on this topic? Um, not, not. To, I don't want to get on my soapbox, uh, but go ahead. I will. It's perfect time to get on the soapbox. I'll, I'll offer maybe a, a, an example, right? That, that we can sort of consider. You know, wouldn't and right now I, I'm I, I work on ransomware now at Microsoft um, as an assistant general counsel, but. Um, so one of the things I think about are, wouldn't it be interesting if um, we had an international um, agreement of whatever that, in whatever form that is, international norm that says um, hospitals are off limits, right? Or, or uh, if we had an international um, mechanism, a mechanism to sort of agree internationally that, um, you know, cyber cyber weapons are not for sale, right? Or, or whatever, whatever it is. I feel like there is space to counter a bit of what Morgan was, was explaining, um, just, just for fun. Um, you know, there is space for us to raise costs, make um, cyber crime at least, if not, uh, not demotivate nation state actors, but maybe demotivate cyber criminals or cyber mercenaries um, by, by reducing profits in this space coming from a ransomware mindset. Um, I think there is, you know, sharing signals across, uh, across friendly countries, across frenemies. Um, you know, what if home affairs uh, in Australia works with, with CISA in the United States, which they do? Um, what if they, they have more opportunity to collaborate? What if they have more opportunity to, to share um, supply side or supply chain intelligence, um, you know, in a, in a controlled environment uh, that's not available to those that decide not to sign on to the same cyber norms. Um, these are just some, just food for thought as you consider whether it makes sense or whether it's even worth having uh, international norms or, or finding cyber diplomacy as using cyber diplomacy as a tool uh, in this space. Yeah, the um, Internet Governance Forum, the International Internet Governance Forum has had that dialogue around hospitals specifically, you know, like, can you put things off limits? And when we first started having a discussion like 15 years ago, the, you know, the ability to obfuscate, we were still force functioning through that from a technical perspective. And I think we've gotten better about it, but the, it is now that we know that people are getting very good at targeting and ransomware is such a huge issue. I'm sure you're very, very busy is um, that, you know, that we, 
just knowing now that that's off limits, like actually needing to be very public about the policies of like, this is a absolute hard stop, no go, you will go to a horrible prison for the rest of your life, or you know, whatever the, the decision is on that. Um, is I think we're ready for that more so than we were when we were just trying to make it a very technical conversation, you know, probably several years ago. Uh, so you guys are all on to some great things. We are down to four minutes. Good job. This has been a great conversation. One thing, and I'm not, I'm a little confused about what's going on in the chat, but I do see this one. And this is a, going back to actually more, well, here it says, Eric Davis asks, uh, how do you see the role of compliance in all of this? Some companies lean heavily into compliance instead of security. I'm a believer that sometimes the compliance is what, forces them to make actually spend money on security. Um, and we didn't even get into insurance as a whole nother discussion, but anyone want to comment on Eric's question? Well, I'll comment that it's uh, probably the, one of the most important questions to ask um, in the sense that uh, there is so much emphasis, too much emphasis in my mind on compliance, because I remember somebody telling me I'd rather be compliant than secure, which is a terrible thing to say. But what, he, what this person was saying was, if I can demonstrate compliance, I'm not going to have, I've got a CYA situation, I can explain to my boss, we're meeting all the requirements, full well knowing that there are things that we could be doing in security that we're not doing. So I think that is ultimately the question. Um, and we're going to have to find the right balance between maybe compliance gets to some basic uh, hygienic type of actions that we just know, those are table stakes, you've got to do this, if you're not doing it, shame on you. And I think, you know, for example, uh, the FTC has done some really good work on that in terms of saying, you know, if you're not doing this uh, activity action, um, you're not being responsible and we're going to hold you accountable for that. Beyond that, we have to explore what does it take, what does it mean to be secure? What are the priorities? What are the most, what, what, are, what are the crown jewels of your organization that need to be protected? What's the best technology? And as well as Morgan says, you know, uh, putting aside the spycraft for the tradecraft for a moment, you know, what are the processes and people and support we need from management and culture to support that? Uh, but we have to build more secure environments and we have a lot of insecurity right now. You bring up an interesting point though, is are there, are there any inducements for proactive positive uh, actions? It actually goes back to the liability reform question that we anybody's seen in place or where we've seen more information coming forward because there's a comfort level about sharing that information? Well, there is the DOD CMMC, the uh, maturity model concept that is coming into play. Um, and hopefully that will, uh, that will improve it. Um, but I, yeah, I, I agree that I think that this compliance over security model is, is flawed. And I think we need to move more to a maturity model uh, where we're giving some benefits uh, for some, for some costs. Uh, I like I like the DoD, although there are some challenges with that as well. You know, I've seen some uh, some uh, technical people, including Bryson Bort on my team, who are not 100 percent pleased with it. But, you know, securing foundational Internet protocols and a national breach notification law. These are some of the things that we could do that would make that sort of baseline uh, reporting requirements and then improve the culture of cybersecurity uh, on top of that. Morgan, you want to get in there? 30, 30 seconds. Yeah. Uh, well, HIPAA has been around for 20 years as compliance, right? And is healthcare more secure today than it was 20 years ago? There's a lot of arguments that way. Unfortunately, compliance has become too much about successes, about the process, not about the outcome. We've got to become more outcome focused, you know, to really make this work. Um, and, and I just get back down to, you know, final thought for me from all of this is that uh, Tatiana hit it really good too. A lot of this is about culture. Culture eats strategy, like Peter Drucker, uh, you know, said one time famously. So we've got to change about how we think about the problem. And here's a novel idea. Rather than the government finding organizations and taking that money and keeping it, instead, make them turn around and spend that $5 million fine on improving their cybersecurity. Quit collecting the revenue, make it because then you force them to spend $5 million on a fine and then another $5 million to fix the problem. Just make the penalty. The fact is you need to take this money we're about to fine you and instead improve your cybersecurity so we can raise the bar and make it tougher We'll never solve all problems, but we can't regulate our way out of this. We can't spend our way out of this. We have to think differently about how we solve this problem. Uh, can you have everybody else 30 seconds of final thoughts and then we have to close down the panel. This has been a great discussion. Thank you guys so much. Final thoughts? Said it all. 
Okay. <laughs> well, thank you guys very much. I, I'm sure the, the people on and Stay of the Net have really enjoyed this conversation and I'm sure you're all available for further discussion. Uh, thank you. I just want to thank Stay of the Net and Tim and Jack and Joe and the whole team because I know that doing this uh, virtually was a, is a bit of a challenge, but I think that I know this panel, I feel like has been a success and I hope that everybody will stay tuned for the rest of the day. So thank you guys for your participation and thank you to the viewers for being active uh, listeners and viewers on this, this panel discussion. Thank you, Shane. All right. Thanks so much. Great job. Thank you.